Alrighty. Um, as I said in the email, I'm really sorry about the quality of the lecture that you guys got. You deserve better. I had been uh, traveling quite a bit, taking my uh, mother to a couple of uh, medical appointments um, that were really complicating uh, my teaching schedule for uh, the first couple of days of this week. And so I was not getting home in time other than to do anything except for to, to meet my appointments from my office hours, teach my class, and then turn right around and leave very early the next day to go to a appointment several hundred miles away only to turn around, drive back, get back just in time for a class and do this. And this was after uh, having some insomnia over the weekend and I was about as tired as I've ever been in my life and I apologize that that uh, there were times in that I'm sure that that lecture made absolutely no sense whatsoever. There was a couple times where I was like I completely lost where I was at and what I was trying to say and think about. So after I thought about that for a bit, I decided the best thing to do was to delete the uh, recordings off of the uh, Zoom and to make a new lecture, which is what I'm doing now. And I will post this uh, as a YouTube video and link it back into um, the uh, Canvas shell so you guys will have access to a good lecture. Uh, about the things that uh, we talked about here in week nine. So let's talk about queries. What are queries? Well, queries are just uh, written or text-based sort of uh, statements, programming language, if you will, that extract specific content uh, from a database or a map. Uh, we have two types, spatial and aspatial. Aspatial being ones that deal with attributes and spatial queries being ones that deal with location. Um, you can use this as a means of selecting certain things. Here we have a map. We've got different types of land cover. You can do a query where you search just for a specific land cover type and the ones that you select are the ones are the ones that you ask for in the query are the ones that are selected. You could then do a couple of things. You could export them as, an, as a data set or you could just simply uh, use this as a means of representing representing those differently. Uh, you can also use this as a way to explore patterns. A lot of times in complex data sets, it's, as the old saying goes, it's really hard to see the forest for the trees. And each of these polygons, think of them as little trees. And when you look at this complex uh, group of polygons, it could be challenging to understand what's going on. But if you're looking for clusters, for example, of a certain type or certain types of trees, you could simply query all those types and then look at them across the area. And you might notice, like you see here, there are a couple little bundles of this vegetation where it's more near to each other than there are. And there's other large, large parts of this where there's none of these things. And so it allows you to identify potential patterns and that can lead to uh, developing some hypotheses that you might test later. Uh, you can isolate certain things. Maybe once you pull up that section of, of stuff that you're looking at, maybe there's one of those that you're not entirely sure about, or maybe there's an entirely different variable that you're interested in. So you identified all the certain species. Now you want to look at the size or the density and so that you can actually figure out that, hey, two of those clusters, if you will, really don't have anything that matters and that everything that we need is all down here in the bottom. We can use queries to explore a lot of spatial relationships, like what fractions of stands of trees are intersected by roads, what types of trees are adjacent to the aspen stands that we're looking for uh, from the textbook. Lots of different ways you can explore these relationships of what's where and what's near what. We can also do queries on surfaces, so it's not just about discrete objects. Remember back to the old pirate test, the difference between discrete and continuous. Uh, continuous is like elevation. Everywhere you go, you have an elevation. Either it's you know sea level, below sea level, or something above sea level, but there's always an elevation. Whereas discrete objects have defined stop and start points, like the old walk in the plank on a pirate ship. The captain, she was not real happy with my performance 
as a pirate. Maybe I'm not a good pirate. Maybe I'm too good at pirate. Maybe she thought I was going to try to take over the ship. I don't know. Regardless, maybe I'm just that dastardly kind of a pirate that uh, they had to get me off the boat. Maybe I have poor personal hygiene. I don't know why. Whatever reason, the old uh, uh, boss lady there, she could have told me to walk the plank. Start walking the plank. I'm still on the boat. Still on the boat. Still on the boat. There's going to come a point, though, when I stop being on that pirate boat and I start being in the ocean. That's discreet. When we look at continuous surfaces like elevation, we can still do queries on that. We can look at a range of elevations. Okay, what about all the elevations above 1,500 meters? We can use that in one data set to examine the other data set. Do the aspen trees occur below that or above that valuation, or above, above that level? What's the lowest elevation where we find aspens? Maybe we could you know, use one to help adjust the other to figure things out. Lots of opportunities to do this sort of stuff and to find new things out from your data. Let's look specifically at attribute queries. Attribute queries are um, more basic and more um, more what people who work as like database administrators would be accustomed to, uh, because this is essentially the same kind of queries that you would do on any database. Uh, the fact that this is spatial data and a GIS is more or less irrelevant. Uh, we're going to approach this the same way. We're going to use SQL or some other programming language. In this case, we're talking about SQL, a structured query language. It allows us to um, put together the phrasing that tells the software what specifically we want and how we want it. Queries can be used in multiple database environments. Uh, they can be saved. You can reuse them. The downside is a lot of times they're case sensitive, and so subtle things like capital, le capital letters or misspellings will miss large chunks of your data set. So one of the things in, in uh, GIS that is helpful is we have these GUIs, these graphic user interfaces, set up with our SQL programming language so that we do a series of drop downs and selections and buttons to click that will then populate the SQL expression without you have to be without you being put in the position of typing the stuff out and potentially making mistakes. Uh, these query sets, I'm going to just cover this real, real, I, I went on and on about some of these last time. I remember talking about it, uh, and I picked Louisiana State uh, LSU as the college, but we're just going to go with what it says here on the slides today. Uh, T is the university, whatever the university is that we're talking about. Rutgers, St. John's, um, Holy Cross, it doesn't matter. Whatever the school is, all the students in the school are in population T. That's the big circle. A is the students from New York, B are the ones that are studying geography, C are the ones who are studying English. Queries are just a ways of collecting these subsets of data. For example, you could just say, how many students are from New York? Well, it's all the students that are in A. But if you wanted to know how many students from, are from New York who study geography, then it's the students who are in A and in B. And then that narrows it down to just those overlapping areas. And that's essentially how these sort of interactions work. And the whole point of this is to get a grip on and and or. And means it has to meet both criteria or means it has to meet one or the other. Single criteria are easy. Double criteria are not bad. And has to meet both or one or the other. Um... I'm not going to go through all these uh, repetitively. Uh, if you've watched, uh, if you read the chapter and went through the activities and the tutorials that Price has and read the text before you on these slides, uh, you're good. Uh, essentially, what we're talking about is Borlean expressions and and or are Borlean operators. 
and they are basically means of evaluating pairs of conditions and the response you get is either one yes or zero no and so when you have a and b every part of those two populations has to meet both criteria if it does it gets a value of one if it doesn't it's a value of zero and yes so you can see here from the illustration the overlap is the one and everything else is the zero but with the or if it's in either a or in b it meets the criteria and there are some other ones that, that come across as well uh, i'm going to skip that one 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 these xors and nots are kind of important the xor for lack of a better way of explaining it is when you have two data sets that do have some overlap it selects all of both data sets except for the part that is overlapped so it's everything but that which is common to both sets and the not function is a little different it's all of the first one less whatever part of it is also in the second one now one of the things you got to be aware of is the commutation of operators some things it doesn't matter which direction you go and some it does and or and not or are commutative in other words a and b is the same as b and a a or b is the same as b or a a and x or b and b x or a are the same it doesn't matter right to left left to right it's the same answer the not function is commutative is not commutative it's different a and not b is not the same thing as b and not a as far as orders of operation boiling operators have equal order of precedence evaluation always starts on the left and goes to the right if you want to change the direction you have to put in parentheses so it's kind of like i don't know fifth grade algebra when you start learning about doing this stuff in the parentheses before you do the stuff outside the parentheses then outside those parentheses you can have brackets or other parentheses or whatever it is uh, you have to work at it just like algebra okay not going to say anything there uh, some more repetitive testing to just get you through the same spot where you already want to be to learn what and and or mean multiple conditions uh, price will run you through a gamut of combinations of ands and ors and other things and putting parentheses in different spots to see what kind of outputs you get that will be sufficient we're not going to try to describe all that in text form here in lecture because um, it's best to learn that by doing I think partial matches when you're running queries you have this capacity to use a quote unquote wild card which is uh, something that allows you to select data that meets somewhat what you're asking for uh, or searches uh, a particular field for part of it to match it doesn't have to match everything and they're talking about using the words MC or MAC uh, to find parts of it like that can also be useful with some complex data sets a lot of times particularly with like text files here we have a name of political representatives and we have their party affiliation after their name in parentheses represented by a capital R or capital D there's probably a capital I somewhere in that list there might even be a libertarian somewhere uh, but none of that's not the point the point is if we're trying to find for example all the Democrats in this list that's the people that have that D in parentheses after their name so how do we search for that well we can use the wild card um, to look for that capital D and it'll find all of them um, the wild card sort of narrows it down and it'll ignore some of the things like Don and Danforth uh, and so you have to be cautious about how you use these things because it will find some stuff but it won't find everything so if you put like parentheses around or um, the percent sign around the words new with a space at the end of new 
it'll find new as in New Hampshire, new with a space, new as in New York, new with a space, but not Newcastle because there's no space, or Kennewick where new is literally just in the middle of the word. Um, the likelihood that the first time that you have to do this you will recall this is just infinitesimally small. So my thought is if you're aware that you can use it, do this and you come to a point where you need to do this, you can look up how to do this. So that's what you should do. Spatial queries. Um, basic spatial relationships are the key to understanding spatial queries because spatial queries always start out with some sort of a conditional statement and then uh, you apply that to different parts of the data sets uh, and there's a couple of those that we want to talk about start with our intersection containment and proximity intersections all about things that cross containments are all about things that are inside proximity is all about something being close to something uh, here are some of these spatial operators that you can see uh, spatial queries allow you to employ any number of these that and you can test for these specifically uh, in terms of the different things, whether it's containment or intersection or proximity. But here are just a few examples of what's out there. Um, price goes on and on and on about target and source. I think um, it gets confusing the more we talk about target versus source in terms of these relationships. Um, Uh, different intersection operators, uh, you can see here there's a several of them. There are also some unique and special cases. One of them we're going to talk about later is the Clementini. Um, when we look at types of containment, you can have things like contains. One is completely inside another, like uh, certain counties are within the state boundaries of Oregon. Uh, but it might touch the boundary of Oregon, but that's okay, it's still within. Others, like completely contains, literally means it can't even touch the border. It has to be completely surrounded by the other item. It can't share a coincide boundary. And then we get to our good buddy Eliso Clementini and his co-authors, who they don't list, and I'm assuming that's probably because their names aren't nearly as cool. They're actually listed at the bottom of the slide. So it's Aliso Clementini, Paulino Di Felice, and Peter Van Ostorom, I think. We'll go with that. A uh, small set of formal topological relationships suitable for end-user interactions. This is from the proceedings from the third international symposium on advances in spatial databases. I bet that was just a rip-roaring convention. Um, Basically, what they were saying is there are these occasional weird things that come up. And the best example that they have going is the Rio Grande in Texas. What Clementini and his co-authors established was that sometimes the boundary of a polygon needs to be separate from the inside of the polygon and from the outside of the polygon. That it simply just needs to be the boundary. And so when you have a Clementini operator, it's equivalent to the standard operator, except when the source feature lies on the boundary of the target feature. And when that happens, it gets a little complicated. And the example is the Rio River, the Rio River. The Rio Grande River lies on the border of Texas. So the contains operator would select the Rio Grande as being part of Texas. The Clementini contains would not. Why? Because the Rio Grande is, in fact, the border. And if it is the border, it is not part of Texas. It's also not part of Mexico. It is the border. And that's the, the gist of how the Clementini configuration works. You also have proximity, distance, how close something is to something. And then there's a three-dimensional version of that as well that are also useful. Um, here we have counties that contain state capitals, counties that are within a distance of a particular city, uh, counties that intersect rivers, rivers that intersect the state of Texas. There's lots of different types of spatial queries we could be interested in. 
cities that are within 20 miles of an interstate, cities that are in counties named Washington. I have no idea why you would want to ask that question, but if you did, you could answer it. Um, scale and accuracy problems, they're a real bear for containment, uh, proximity, and distance issues as far as spatial um, queries go. And accuracy is, you know, if things are not accurate, they're just not accurate. There's nothing you can really do about that. But the scale, the scale is the one that will get you. So here on this map, we've got this blue line representing a particular river, which at the scale that the blue line was drawn is probably very accurate and is a fair approximation of where that river is. However, in the background, you see an aerial image, aerial photo. That photo is at a higher scale than what the blue line is. It's more detailed. It's more nuanced. And so it doesn't always align with the river, with the blue line of the river. If you're looking at distances, how far something is from something, if you're using lines that are drawn at different scales, you're going to get different outcomes. Because if you look there, what's the distance between that pink dot on the left and the blue line versus the pink dot and the actual river there near it? It's much further to the actual river than it is to the blue line. Other places like the second blue dot, the distance is going to be the same. Why? Because it's straight down and at that particular point, they match. So some places it won't be off, other places it could be off a bunch. In fact, you may not even be able to tell which side of the river something is on because the representation could be off by that much. And that's all because of scale. <clears throat> the accuracy is really a byproduct of that. When we say, when I, in terms of accuracy like I'm talking about here, is something, you know, the right distance from something? <clears throat> the answer is highly scale dependent. talk about our old friend topology. Topology is like that buddy that always gives you good advice. And then when you ask him what the good advice was, he gives you different advice. It might still be good, might be bad, but you never get the same thing twice. That's topology issues. Okay, That's what it is in a nutshell. If you have topology, you have an integrated approach to your data management, and the interaction between features is held consistent and constant, so that when there is a coinciding boundary, it stays in one location, and everything that uses that boundary, meets that boundary, is aligned with that boundary in any way. As that boundary moves for one, it moves for all. Years ago, I worked for a fella, and... Uh, he would often call me in and ask my opinion on something uh, when he was kind of being put in a tight spot, uh, like with some data analysis. What do you think about this and what do you think about that? And I always made a point to try to keep track in my head about what I told him the last time he asked. Because a lot of times these weren't clear-cut questions. And so I always tried to make the best possible argument for whatever I didn't make the argument for the time before. I figured... If you're getting paid to make the good decisions, you should make the good decisions. You shouldn't have me make them for you, right? So that's what I would do. That, in topology terms, would just be horrible. If it's a good decision, it should be a good decision regardless of who come up with it. If it's the boundary between North Dakota and South Dakota, it's the boundary between North Dakota and South Dakota. If the Pine Ridge Indian Reservation is supposed to go to the Nebraska border, then it should go to the Nebraska border. It shouldn't be a gap. There shouldn't be an overlap. The Shannon and Bennett County lines should align to the Pine Ridge Indian Reservation border because it's all the same line. When you don't have data that is topologically integrated, you construct each element on its own, and there's no moorings there to tie things together. With topology, 
true topology, you could make those things happen. Let's talk about extraction functions. Uh, the two big ones that we use a lot are clip and erase. I like to describe this like this. We have two data sets. We have the cookie cutter and the cookie dough. All right. Clip extracts features within the boundary. The boundary is the cookie cutter. The other feature is the cookie dough. When you use the clip, you take the cookie cutter, you apply it to the cookie dough, and you essentially get the cookie. Erase is different. Erase, you still have the cookie dough, and you still have the cookie cutter, but you basically throw the cookie away, and you're left with the remnant cookie dough. When we do things like that, whether we're cutting something out and keeping it, or we're cutting something out and looking at the rest of the data, certain features are going to get cleaved in half. Maybe not in half, but they're going to get shortened, trimmed, truncated, whatever verbiage you choose. What happens is at the end of the day, the lengths of some lines change. The areas of some polygons change. In your attribute tables, these changes are not always reflected in the numbers in the attributes. Oftentimes, these sorts of functions, these extractions, as well as things like um, projecting your data, can change these numbers. Here we have a clip and erase, going through the same thing we just talked about. We can see how these roads get shortened. Turns out, if and only if you have a feature class in a geo database, if and only if the length and area measurements that we're talking about, these geometric fields, are called shape underscore length and shape underscore area, they would be updated automatically. If those length and area fields had any other name, they would not be. If this was a shape file, they would not be. If this feature was not in a geo database, it would not be updated even if it had those names. Personally, I always assume that they're wrong and I just check them. It's not hard to do. You Calculate the geometry again, tell it the projection to use, tell it the units you want, and it gives you new data. On the fly clipping is a temporary clip applied to a map layout, doesn't affect the new layers or affect the lengths. It can be done on lots of layers simultaneously, and you can remove it when you no longer need it. It's a data frame property. In other words, it's just something to make things look better. And this shows you where you can get in to do it. The big thing that helps us most with queries, or the biggest thing, the biggest help we get from queries, is the ability to create subsets. One way we can do that is by creating layers. I don't like layers. Layers are dressed up how we display stuff selections. It doesn't actually trim things away. I don't like doing that. I prefer to simply make the selection and then export that as a new data set. I've seen too many students have a layer file and try to do an analysis and think that they got the right answer when in reality they got a completely wrong answer because they just did their calculations, their sums, their totals, their statistics on the entire data set, not just on the stuff that they had highlighted in their layer. Not so much highlighted, the things that was showing up in the layer file. Um, how do we export stuff? Data, export data, creates a new feature. Simple, easy peasy, lemon squeezy. Uh, definition queries, uh, they redefine a layer to include a subset of actual features. The only select features appear on a map, has no effect on the data. Uh, this is some more of those temporary little ways that you can do things. Let's talk about selection. When you look at selection, you have a couple options. You can select things interactively, which means you go on the map and you click stuff. 
or you go into the attribute table and you click stuff. Or you can select by locations, by attributes, by graphics, and other things. When you select by attributes, there's different methods. So you can create a new selection, you can add to a current selection, you can remove from a current selection, or you can select from a current selection. Uh, lots of different things that you can do, all within the GUI, uh, all contributing to allowing you to create different data sets later. They call it the two-step. Um, they're going to go through a whole bunch of stuff about this and about different ways you can leapfrog around. I'm not going to get too much into it until we get to the last slide, and I'm going to tell you how I do it. Uh, you can combine queries, um, search for one thing, search for the other thing, put them together, find stuff that only meets two criteria. That's kind of what we're talking about. Same thing works with spatial queries as well and with attribute queries. Um, spatial joins are a little different. Um, we know with attribute joins it's not really complicated. You've got to have two fields that have the same information in them. By the same information, I don't mean that they have to be like identical. I mean it has to be the identical kind of information. If it's county names, it needs to be county names. If it's state names, it needs to be state names. If it's a FIPS number, it needs to be a FIPS number. It doesn't matter if it's called FIPS, State FIPS, uh, Dr. FIPS, or whatever. As long as that column of information, that field, is the same information, the name of the field is not really important. Essentially, once you have that, then you can join it where it makes the 27077 in one line up with the 27077 in the other so that you can then attach the other part of those attributes to the other data set. Don't get too riled up about this whole thing about sources and destinations and all that nonsense. Think about it like this. You want to take data from one data set and join it to another data set. Always start with that data set where you want the data to end up. So if you want to take the data from this and add it to that, you go to the that, and that's where you initiate the join. And that's how spatial joins work. Two relationships based on a common spatial relationship, one inside another, one close to another, these all work great. However, sometimes um, distance spatial joins are what we do. Something's not always inside something. So sometimes it's the closest thing. Remember when we talked about modifying things and changing projections and how that can change stuff? Is something in a GCS or something's in a PCS? That can all impact distances between things. Inside joins are easy. If this is inside that, it gets all that. Cardinality is simple. It's one to one. Could be many to one, but we'll talk about that too. Cardinality. All right, cardinality. When you're joining data, there's something called the rule of joins, which says you can only join one thing to one thing. If you try to do more than that, it's not going to work. It's a violation. If you're trying to join multiple things to a single thing, the only way you can do it is if you summarize those multiple things into a single thing. Because it always has to be a single thing being joined to a single thing. Cities, many city records become a single record containing some statistics which can then be joined to the airports. In the example here on the left, you have the airplane, which represents the airport. The blue is the cities. Uh, we use a distance join to identify which airport is the closest for every city. And then we're going to combine that data. We want to know how many people are served by that airport. So what do we want to do? We want to combine the populations from all those cities to that airport. That's many things that we're trying to join into one that doesn't work unless you summarize it. So you can see here, for example, um, the Bend Municipal Airport. There are 21 cities that surround that where that is the closest airport. And they have a combined population of 38,589 people. All the information for each of those little cities was summarized into a single entity. 
single entry that could then be joined to that single entry of the airport. That's what summarized joins do, and they work really awesome. Spatial join cardinality, this is where it starts to get a little fuzzy. Simple one-to-one, -one, no problem. They call it many-to-one, and that sounds like it's what I'm just now telling you you don't want to do. But when they talk about many-to-one, they're really talking about having lots of entities that get information from a single entity. I would consider that taking one to many, not many to one. Uh, but I'm not going to argue about that. What I'm going to tell you is if you have all the cities and all the counties in a particular state, like we see down here on the bottom right, you could very easily take the county data and add it to each of those cities. Why? Because you're still taking one county's information and attaching it to one city. Even though there's multiple cities, and there's so there's many cities and there's only one county, but you can still do that because that one-to-one -one relationship still remains intact. It only has to become summarized when you're going the other direction, where if you want to take the city data and join it to the county, then you have multiple cities then it has to be summarized. All right. When we have point data and we're trying to join it, that's where we can start to have some problems. Um, we can do distance joins. Are they going to be simple? Are they going to be summarized? It really depends on what you're trying to do. Uh, if you're trying to figure out which attraction is closest to each hotel, it's only going to be one. If you want to know how many... Um, how many attractions uh, you want to know which hotel is the closest for each attraction then you could end up with multiple attractions per one hotel like you see here and so all the green are closest to one all the brown are closest to one all the purple are closest to one if you want to join that data up you have to decide do i want to join just the one to it or do i want to join the hotel to each of the stars if I'm joining each of the stars data to the hotel, then I have to summarize it. Look at the types of spatial joins. This nice little Venn sort of, di not a Venn diagram, I don't know what you call it here, a box maybe. Uh, we either have inside joins or distance joins. Inside joins mean this is inside that, pretty easy. Distance joins means this is close to that, pretty easy. We can have simple, which is we have that one-to-one -one sort of interaction, or we can have summarized where we have to take multiple entities of, uh, uh, that exist and summarize that into a single entry to then pair up with the other single entry. Let's look at feature geometry and spatial joins. Distance joins points to polygons, each county uh, Join each county to the hospital that it's nearest to. You have a hospital. Let's see here. I'm going to get this right. Each county feature gets the name of the closest hospital and the distance. So some counties don't have hospitals. They just simply need to know what is their closest hospital and how far away it is. That is a distance point to polygon join. Um, polygon distances are always from the centroid. That can be a problem if you have a highly irregular shape uh, polygon in that the centroid may not actually be inside the polygon. Uh, you can specify in some instances that you don't want to use the centroid, that you just want to use the boundary. Here we have points and lines. We're looking at the distance between one and the other. And in this scenario, we have streams and we have septics. And the more septic systems that are alongside a section of a stream, the bigger the stream becomes because it's a count of septic systems. Um, it's not really a valid analysis because it doesn't take into consideration the direction of flow. Just because it's a linear distance from a stream does not mean that it is in, a, uh, in fact draining into that stream. There could be um, some topography in between the two that's actually causing it to drain in another direction. When we look at feature types, um, it's important to remember that every join involves two geometries. Okay? They can be the same, like points to points, or they can be different, like 
polygons to lines or lines to points. But when you have a combination like that, um, it offers two possible types. One is usually a simple join and the other is summarized. So you got to decide what it's going to be based on what you need. Um, this is the thing that irritates me the most about this textbook and this particular textbook author is after they spend so much time hammering home things like source and destination, they go and flip it around for one little bit here. So that's one of the reasons I don't spend much time talking about it. This is just a nice little layout about joining points to points and lines to points, and polygons to points, and whether it's simple or distance in some examples of what that would be. I'm not going to sit here and read these all off to you. You can go back and look at these. They're in your textbook too. Have some examples, destinations and hospitals, simple distances are summarized. Polygons and points, simple and simple, simple distance and simple insides, different, you know, again, more examples. More examples. You have to think about some of the things because sometimes when you try to make a particular join, if it just doesn't make sense, there's probably a reason it doesn't make sense. It's probably because it's not what you should be doing. Um, here we have each urban area, uh, the attributes of the county that it falls inside. That's, that's easy enough. Even if you have multiple urban areas, they still only get one copy of the county data. But if you flip it, if each county is going to get data from their urban areas, some counties have multiple ones. And so that won't work because you can't have four entries going into one unless you summarize it so that you maintain that one-to-one -one scenario. Same thing here with parks and such. Turns out when you do this stuff, there's really not a lot of combinations. So spend a little time at the beginning trying to figure out what it is you need to do, and then just do it. If it doesn't work, it'll usually be pretty obvious. And if it doesn't work, there's usually only going to be one other way to do it. So don't fret if it doesn't always turn out right from the get-go. Coordinate systems are also an important component of this. If you have data in a GCS and you try to do some of this stuff, first thing is you should be hearing a voice in the back of your head that sounds a lot like mine saying never, ever, ever do any kind of analysis on data in a GCS for lots of reasons. But in this example, the units, distances should be in meters or feet or some linear distance. This distance is in an angular distance. This is in some kind of degree measurement. It's completely useless. You need to have this in a projected coordinate system before you try to do this kind of stuff. What happens if you're not in a projected coordinate system and you look at things like distance joins? Well, it turns out the distortions that can be created from trying to map stuff in a GCS can actually make the joins, the distance joins, wrong. Here we have two different displays of the exact same data. One, it's in a GCS, and the other, it's in a UTM projected coordinate system. The three stars in the circle in the GCS will translate to being closest to Hotel C. Once you place them in a projected coordinate system, they're actually closer to Hotel B. That's a significant error if you don't do that. Never ever do any analysis in a GCS of any sort, of any kind. Beware data frame coordinate systems may be different from your source. Um, changing that's not always going to fix it. Don't rely on on the fly projection to solve the world's problems because it does not. Take your data, decide what coordinate system you should be working in for the project it's going to be some projected coordinate system. Change all your data into that coordinate system. In other words, project 
all your data sets into the same coordinate system that you chose for your map document. Setting up spatial joins are easy as far as I'm concerned. They talk to you about doing this sketching and setting everything up and figuring out destinations and sources and cardinalities and oh, 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 oh I drive you crazy. All the congressional districts that have had more than 10 earthquake deaths. Okay. How would you do it? And they go through this big long list of stuff trying to walk you through this crazy process. Same way with this. Develop a pollution rivers index based on the total number of people in the adjacent counties. How are you going to join that stuff up? And they go through the whole thing and what you got to do. You know, this is an example here for summarized and all that and the other. Volcanoes closest to each city. Same way here with the volcanoes and the cities and figuring it all out. This is the last slide, so I had to come back and record it over because I want to make sure that I get to the point that I've not really gotten to in the last couple slides, and that is when you're trying to do a join like this, spatial join, you start out with the data set that you want to join the other stuff to. That's what comes in first. When you do that, it's going to narrow down your options. If you're going to be doing a summarized join, think about what you, how you want that summarized. Do you need the count? Do you need the average? If you're not sure, just select all of them. It makes your attribute table come out bigger, but it's not going to be a big problem. The other thing is some of these other options here. Each point gets all the attributes, or each point gets a summary. You can figure out what will work run it. If it doesn't work, don't freak out. Don't say, well, I tried it. You know, it's like punting in football. To rearrange the field position and start anew is not a bad thing. It's a bad thing if you have to continue to keep doing it and you never make any progress offensively. It's the same way in a GIS. If you do a join that doesn't work, it's not like we're going to come take your software license away and make you become an English major. We're not going to do that. Now, if you can never get a join to work, we're not going to graduate you either. Okay? You're not going to get the certificate. You're not going to get the associate. You're never going to do this work. But you don't have to get it right the first time. You just have to learn to get it right at some time. So work back through these things, read your chapter. Hopefully that will help. And hopefully this was a lot better lecture.